Welcome back to BayLearn. It's my great pleasure to welcome you back to this afternoon session. My name is Isabel Guyon. I'm one of the uh, co-founders of BayLearn. It's a great pleasure for me to see how much it's grown. And uh, it's my honor this afternoon to welcome uh, Jennifer, who, uh, who has been um, graduating from uh, University of Toronto in 2007 and has uh, recently joined UC Berkeley in January 2018 uh, after spending many, many years at Microsoft in three different places. And uh, all of the time, she has had the pa passion, uh, machine learning and molecular biology. And she's been combining the two with great talent. She's uh, known for her work on uh, CRISPR-Cas that has had a lot of impact. And she's, she's created some tools that are used worldwide, machine learning tools, to determine uh, what are the positions where you should clip proteins. And uh, today, she's going to surprise us with a brand new work that she's been doing uh, uh, in molecular biology. And without further ado, Jennifer. Great. Thank you. Okay, uh, so first of all, I can't really see, but how many people here uh, know what the letters are, these triplets of letters, just to gauge my audience? Very good. Okay, and who knows what the picture is of? <laughs> um, okay, so I'll give you a little bit of a hint. So uh, what the triplets of, of DNA there are in codons, each of which includes an amino acid, which is, of course, the building block of proteins. And uh, so, okay, still, what is this thing? This is actually a, a two-dimensional variational autoencoder uh, probabilistic embedding. So at any particular point, uh, is there supposed to be a pointer? Okay. Um, hmm. All right, that's... If someone can give me a pointer, that'd be great. But in any case, so this is a two-dimensional embedding, and at any point is the most probable decoding of the two-dimensional latent space for the codons. So why am I telling you this? It turns out that these kinds of things are very, very useful in uh, various places in molecular biology. And this is a sort of new area that I'm getting into, which is protein design. And uh, there have been a few attempts to solve a particular problem that I'll tell you more about in just a second. And most of them use something like a variational autoencoder somewhere in there for one reason or another. And the example that I've shown you right here is to do protein engineering um, for proteins that fluoresce. In this case, they fluoresce at four different wavelengths. And you can imagine that you want to pick a sequence that, say, fluoresces the most or fluoresces at a particular wavelength or something like this. So that's like a protein engineering, protein design problem. Okay, so here's, this is actually uh, from a paper that got me interested in this area from Bombarelli et al. And they do use a variational autoencoder. Uh, they actually, they learned it in a supervised way and they supervise it according to the property they care about. Uh, they're actually doing chemistry, not protein engineering. And the property was like, for example, drug likeness. And so they, they, what their, their motivation here is to learn a variational autoencoder embedding that converts this discrete space in which it's hard to do optimization to a real valued space in which they want to then move around uh, by maximizing a GP function. And so that just gives you a, a sense of maybe how these things come in. And I'm going to tell you more uh, about a method that we developed in more details and just uh, very shortly. So, but more broadly, when I, I'm trying to just make a point here that evolution has created these very informative structures in our DNA and, and in other places. And so machine learning and statistics, as, as Isabel said, I've been doing this for over a decade, uh, are very good at helping us to understand and make sense of this structure in useful ways. And you can really tackle a very broad range of problems uh, at this interesting section that I, I think are extremely exciting. And so I'm going to just give you a flavor of some of them in the beginning here before I dive in uh, deeper into, the, into this new one. And if there's time, uh, I may also talk about a second one, but <laughs> this is a new talk. I'm not actually sure how long it is, so we'll see. Uh, so, right, so this is something I spent many years working on, genome-wide association studies, where you collect, say, a group of people, such as there is in this hall, and you measure their genetics, perhaps, let's say, a million markers along the genome. And the simplest thing you could do is you could try to just ask which markers on the genome, and that's the genome that's displayed on the bottom there, um, 
uh, and it, and this the sort of the higher something is, the more evidence there is that that particular location on the genome is implicated in, say, a disease. And so the disease here are the people with the cases. They have a particular disease, and the controls don't. So this is a sort of um, at, at a very basic level, it's actually a pretty rudimentary statistical problem. But there's some really interesting stuff that happens. And again, we can start to use um, embeddings of genetics to help us uh, make sense of these data. And so something that can happen is sort of hidden confounding factors that arise from a certain diversity in the population that's not obvious at the outset. And that diversity can have to do with racial background. It can also have to do with sort of clusters of people like pedigrees and parents and grandparents. And it turns out if you have this kind of stuff in the data, things get really messed up. Uh, and if I have time, I'll tell you a little bit about that. But uh, again, here we can sort of build a covariance matrix from the DNA. And then in this case, this is a linear embedding. This is not a variational autoencoder, which is actually just PCA. And what's been done is it's the covariance variance matrix of the, using the genetics of a large cohort of people where we know that their origin in Europe, which of course PCA does not know, and now they've been projected into a two-dimensional space, and actually it, it basically um, roughly recapitulates the map of Europe. So that's pretty amazing. This is now very old work, and it somehow gets at uh, what's going on in this problem, and I'm just trying to give you a, a taste of it right here. Uh, and so Isabel also mentioned that I, uh, my, some of my very recent work has been on using machine learning for CRISPR gene editing. This is a video showing what are amount to the genetic scissors. This is this big thing, and it has to go in, it has to pull apart the double-stranded DNA, and uh, when it does so, then it can make a cut. After the cut, uh, you can edit, or you can cut it and just disable the gene. And so we can, uh, and so there's, this is a very rapidly moving field in terms of the molecular biology. People are trying to make the system more precise, uh, but there's, there's still lots of room to, to make it better still, and a synergistic way to make it better is to actually use machine learning modeling to do this. And so in this sort of pictorial uh, example here, the idea is you want to cut a particular gene and disable it, and there's many hundreds of places at which you could cut it and disable it, but only some of these will work. And so, uh, you know, as a standard sort of supervised machine learning setup, if you can get some examples, you can hope to tease apart this function, f, uh, that will then let other people in the world who want to make, uh, disable a gene, they can apply this for their gene that's never been tested, and they know where to go cut that gene so as to disable it. So this is an area that I am um, waiting for the right uh, student to get excited and work on. I haven't worked on it, but I think it's a beautiful problem. And so this is drug repurposing. So drug repurposing refers to the fact that the, it, many drugs have already cleared FDA screening. They're very useful for some indication. And as you know, every now and then we find another indication for which a drug is useful. And usually this happens through serendipity. And so what drug repurposing is, is a way to sort of systematize that serendipity and say, can we use molecular data to figure out which drugs, which are already approved and working well for some indication, might work well for another indication. And so just to give you a flavor, of how one might do that. You can measure the gene expression uh, in a cell. You can think of gene expression as the amount of, of, for sort of a bunch of proteins, their precursor in the body, and it's like a 20,000 long vector, uh, which in some sense represents the state of a cell. So you can take uh, gene expression, and you can perturb it with a drug. So you, you get some tissue, and you measure the gene expression, this 20,000 long vector. Then you perturb it with a drug, and you measure it again. So now you have a sort of delta 20,000K uh, characteristic vector. And you can do this for many, many uh, drugs. And so this kind of tells you how a drug uh, affects the state of a cell. And separately, you can get a sort of perturbation by asking, how does the disease affect a cell? And so instead of perturbing with a drug, you sort of gather some observational data where people have a disease and they don't, and you again get this sort of difference in this 20,000 long vector. And so the hypothesis is that if you scan this sort of now database of, of drug perturbation vectors and disease perturbation vectors, and you look for them to be anti-correlated, then that drug may be a good candidate for that uh, for that disease. And so that's a sort of very simplistic statistical description. There's actually many very rich and difficult computational, statistical, and machine learning problems in there uh, that I haven't gotten into, but I'm just trying to give you a flavor of sort of the broad range of really important and interesting problems in this space. <laughs> 
So, and, and generally, as in sort of any applied domain, we have many of the same challenges here. And so, although it's a bit funny to say large scale, so this is, of course, in the eye of the beholder. So in, in some sense, we actually don't have large scale data at all compared to like vision and speech where you can so cheaply get these data. So it, it can be large and unwieldy, these whole genomes to deal with. But at the same time, we're typically not well powered to see the signal we would like to see. Um, and that's because it's super, super expensive in general to collect this, right, as compared to vision and speech. It's just really, really, and not just expensive, it actually requires a huge amount of ingenuity from the people doing the molecular biology end of this. But, and then, you know, we have other problems that, uh, you know, are span many fields of combinatoric explosion, these hidden confounding factors that I've alluded to. Uh, we have the models that work well in a lot of these places are very computationally expensive and the data sets are huge. So you need to actually do things that are still rigorous and principled, but let you maybe back off a bit. Um, and so unlike maybe in, in machine learning uh, as much, there's a, a big emphasis on hypothesis testing here. And we have massive scale hypothesis testing, which can be interesting. And of course, causality is a very key issue that is often glossed over, but is, is quite interesting in genetics. Okay, so, and you know, the solutions we use, I'm not a, I'm not a Bayesian, I'm not a frequentist, I'm happy to use anything, so uh, you name it, I've probably used it at some point in my career. Uh, and so now I wanna take this chance to tell you about two projects. So the first one is this almost the first time I've really spoken about it, which is why I don't know how long this talk is. Uh, and so I'm gonna tell you most about that, and if there's some time, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about more of that problem I mentioned with these genome-wide association studies and a new direction that I'm working on there as well. Okay, so the protein design problem, and I should say I'm, I've instantiated this with protein design, but the, we've just put this paper on archive and it's written in a much more general way, and I think this may have uh, impact well beyond anything in biology, but I'm gonna cast it as a protein design problem. So what I wanna do is I wanna say, I'm given some model that goes from some design space, and like the design space is gonna be DNA, and by design space, it's, some, it's a space in which I want to design. So I'm gonna design a sequence that suits me, and I'm gonna design a sequence that suits me because it has a particular property or several properties that I care about. And in this case, it's going to be protein yield. And so an input to this method that I'm going to tell you about is that I have a, a model that goes from the design input space to properties of interest. And what I want is I want a method that will tell me what sequence or what input I can choose that will maximize or satisfy these properties. And additionally, I may have some constraints of the design space. So, uh, for example, it may be that I actually want to change the DNA only within the codons that are synonymous for that protein because I want exactly that protein. It could be that I'm allowed to change the amino acids, but subject to the 3D structure of the protein um, remaining relatively the same, for example. And so, right, and so there's different properties people care about. These things might be like, is this sort of have a drug-like property? Does it fluoresce a lot? Does it, is there a lot of it? Because if, if uh, and things like this. There's many, many properties people would like to do. And so importantly here also, we want the input to this method to do design. Like this core, this beast has got to be a black box um, for us, ideally, uh, rather than something that we can take derivatives of. And the reason for this is that there's a rich amount of domain-specific expertise for which it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily encoded in a model on which I can compute derivatives, and we would like to be able to access all of that kind of data and not have to worry about uh, what that kind of model is, although we assume it's um, stochastic. Uh, uh, if it's not stochastic, it's also fine. All right. So. It, it, interestingly, with the day we put this up on, um, on archive, so I actually think of this problem as related to directed evolution, which just got the Nobel Prize earlier this week. And it's a way to kind of actually do these protein design problems. And let me explain to you how it, how it works. So you start off with some protein that fluoresces, and you say, I want it to fluoresce more. So what you do is you kind of throw x-rays or something at it that induces random mutations. Then you go to the lab, and you measure how much each one of these different versions uh, fluoresces, and then it's called directed evolution because you direct the evolution by culling um, out part of those, the set of proteins. You keep only those which fluoresce more, and then you repeat the process. So you're doing this iterative process of changing the proteins, measuring them, and keeping only the ones you want that are good. 
And so we want to do this essentially the way I think about the design problems. We want to do this in an in silico sense. So we want to replace the laboratory measurements with some sort of um, predictive model with uncertainty. And, and more importantly than that, we also want to not just sort of induce random mutations. We don't want to do a random walk. We don't want to do a greedy walk. We want to, do, we want to move around very, very smartly in that design space such that we can get to our a desired goal, even though this is like a combinatorial space. So how are we going to do that? This example is not a black box, but I'm going to take it as my starting point. So again, the input here is someone's going to give me this sort of oracle. We call it a stochastic oracle that goes from the design space, the input sequence, to the predicted properties. And this is how we normally think about machine learning. And we want to actually turn this around. We want to now, um, given such a model, we want to specify some set of properties, and we want to find the sequence. So this may sound familiar to a lot of people here, because one way you can do this is with this activation maximization, right? Where you take a network, it's already been trained, and now you do, you do gradient descent on the inputs. And so that, uh, it stands to reason that that could work. Uh, so one issue with that is we don't have our black box does it um, goal uh, satisfied, and, and it turns out it also doesn't seem to work very well. So, uh, and, and also importantly, we really want to be able to leverage the uncertainty in these predictive models. So you can imagine that if you're searching around a design space, it's going to be very important to know where your predictions are good and where they're bad, especially if you're trying at all to push the envelope and do extrapolation, which you will surely be doing if you're trying to maximize a property. So now I'm going to tell you about this approach with my student, David. Um, so he's, I've been very fortunate. David's my first student since joining Berkeley. And so let me give you a little bit of a taste of how this is going to work. It's a, it may seem like a slightly strange setup. So intuitively, what we're going to do is we're going to create a generative model, uh, which is a generative model for DNA sequences. And so in our case, we are going to use a variational autoencoder. But you could use something else. We do want it to be probabilistic. So right now, we're not uh, particularly interested in GANs. And what we're also going to have is we're going to have this sort of stochastic oracle, this black box that takes an input x, and it tells us the probability that our properties have been satisfied. And uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to slowly shift that distribution, that generative distribution, from an, some random or uh, intelligent initialization. And as, as the iterations go from start to finish, uh, at the end, we're going to end up with a generative model that is generating the sequences that we want um, for our design problem. And we will take a sample from it. And this will be our design sequence. So that's how it's going to work. And I'm going to tell you how, how we get that from a sort of more of a first principles way in just a second. OK, so the formal setup here, it might look a little bit contrived at first, but it, it, uh, it actually makes a lot of sense once you think about it. So we're going to take. Um, if you, this prob S is this sort of set of things that satisfy our desired properties, the set of sequences. And we want to maximize uh, the probability that we're achieving those properties. So we want to get um, some parameter theta. And what is theta? If you look to the second line, theta is actually the parameter from the generative model. So I'm going to sneak in a generative model here. Uh, the, the top line just says, I want the properties uh, that I want to be satisfied um, as much as possible. And then I'm going to do this sort of augmentation where I put in a generative model to give me a distribution over the design space x, and then I'm just going to integrate it out. Uh, and then I can rewrite that integral as an expectation on the last line. And essentially, this is the objective function we want to solve. We want to solve the theta, um, which is the parameters of the generative model, like a variational autoencoder, that are in expectation most likely to satisfy the properties I care about. OK, so how are we going to go about doing that? So the first problem is that I have a log of an expectation. And so this should look familiar to many people. This is the kind of thing we get in expectation maximization and variational inference. And so we can use Jensen's inequality, and we can turn this into a lower bound. Uh, and so that's what we do. We replace the, what we originally had with a, a different maximization problem based on using Jensen's inequality. But it turns out we have a much bigger problem than that. So that's kind of a standard trick. So what's the bigger problem? <laughs> 
So S here, again, are these are the properties that we want to satisfy. So imagine the property I want to satisfy is that I want to maximize the amount of fluorescence of a protein. So what that means is I have some idea of some proteins that uh, fluoresce, but I want to kind of go well beyond what I've ever seen. So what that means is the probability of my desired event from my uh, generative model in the beginning, it's, it's surely not going to be there, right? If my original, my initial generative model could satisfy these properties, then my problem would be solved. So it's sort of, there's it's just not ever going to happen. And so as a consequence of that, this, this probability, S given X, the probability that in the current generative model, uh, samples from it satisfy my, my properties, this is going to be very, very small. And so it's, it's very close to zero, which means that when I want to approximate this with a Monte Carlo-based sampling estimate, the variance of this quantity is going to be very, very high because it's a rare event. And so this is a really fundamental problem, and you basically you just you, you can't do it directly. So how are we going to do that? Uh, yeah, I forgot to advance. That quantity there is the thing that's giving us problems. It's going to tend to be small unless we were somehow super, super lucky with the original generative model. So what we're going to do is we're going to do two things. We're going to relax the initial condition. So if initially the set of the S, if that means I want to maximize the fluorescence, instead I'm going to just push the envelope a little. I'm going to say it needs to be a little bit bigger than what I've seen so far in my training data. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to have this very relaxed condition, and I'm going to slowly anneal it to the desired rare condition. And so what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to keep iteratively updating that generative model. Each time I update the generative model, it's from one of these relaxations, and the relaxations kind of get tighter and tighter. And so by the time I'm done, uh, this, I now actually can sample something that is not high variance because I've sort of slowly trained it to, to figure out what that is. Okay, so uh, you can see how it emerges from some sort of nice probabilistic and sampling-based setup. What it actually turns out to be an extremely simple procedure to implement, and so I'll just take you through the pseudocode here. So what do we need? We need this sort of oracle, and uh, there's sort of different ways one can write this. Uh, this uh, just for technical reasons, this one's applicable when you have homoscedastic noise. Uh, there's a slightly more complicated one if you have heteroscedastic noise. And so the H oracle here is just like a predictive model, like a neural network. So you give it an input, tells you the expected amount of protein yield or fluorescence, just a scalar that comes out. And of course, uh, these models usually have a noise parameter, and so we can compute also the cumulative density function uh, for a particular threshold on that. And so we want both of those. Those are the sort of Oracle black box model that I said in the very beginning was going to be my starting point and that I wanted to somehow kind of invert, right? Something like an activation maximization, but ideally uh, with a black box ability. Uh, the next thing I need is this gen train. This is sort of, again, it's just a black box method. It says, if you give me weighted pairs, uh, weighted training data, so X's is the thing in my design space, so these are DNA sequences, and each one has a weight. You give me a weighted uh, pair of DNA, uh, of training data, and then you return a generative model. So for example, you give me a trained variational autoencoder. So this is how the thing that's going to keep updating our generative model. And then there's some hyperparameters here that I, uh, I'm not going to mention. I'll just say that it's not very sensitive. It's not like you need to set these just right. There's a huge range for which they work, uh, and so those are sort of default settings that will, that will work well. Okay, so uh, one thing that's interesting is we can do this in a zero-shot manner, uh, and so by that I mean that you can seed the very first generative model with sequences that you know about. So imagine you know you're, you want a fluorescent protein and you know the set of fluorescent proteins, you have access to those examples, you could first use those to start off this procedure, but you don't need to. You could also just randomly initialize them and it should still work. And then we're just going to assign uniform weights to each of those examples. So next we're going to do, this is now basically the loop of directed evolution, but it's now done in silico. So what are we going to do? We're going to train a generative model with that initial set of sequences, um, which is in set and the corresponding weights and weights. And then we're going to now generate samples from it. So that's the analog in directed evolution would be to throwing uh, radiation at the sequences and, and watching them mutate, right? So I'm generating samples. 
And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to score each of those samples. So the analog and directed evolution would be I go to the lab and I measure the fluorescence for each of those. So those are like the scores. And now what I do, just like in directed evolution, I'm going to truncate. I'm going to say if you were not in the top 20%, uh, or I'm going to pick a threshold, which is the top 20%, say, uh, of, of, of fluorescence, and that's this gamma over here. So gamma is the sort of the, in the range of predicted fluorescence, what was the cutoff to be in the top 20%. And now, crucially, what falls out, if you um, turn through the math appropriately, is you, get, you weight the samples by the survival function, or one minus the, the CDF. So this is where our ability to leverage the uncertainty in this sort of stochastic oracle comes in, because it's going to have a very dramatic effect on how we weight those samples. So unlike in directed evolution, where you simply you pick a threshold and you're either in or you're out, and then you repeat, here you're not in or out. We actually weight you. So the more you adhere to our property, the more of a weight you'll get. Uh, except that uncertainty is taken into account, kind of in a way analogous to Bayesian optimization, except we're not actually getting new laboratory measurements here, although you could imagine incorporating this in such a setup. And so you, now you just repeat this. And so what's going to happen as you do this more and more, just as in directed evolution, except now you're moving through the space in a vastly more efficient way, because you're not just making random mutations. You're doing something much, much smarter. And at the end, you're going to get basically a generative model, uh, for which is spitting out samples that adhere to your criteria. And one thing I forgot to mention is that at the end of this process, under some uh, um, some conditions, you'll actually get a point mass distribution out. So when will you get a point mass distribution out? You'll get a point mass distribution out if the capacity of the generative model is high enough, and if the condition, the sort of set of events you're interested in is an infinitesimal set, and if you can get um, to the global optimum. In that case, then you actually would get a point mass out that is literally just spitting out exactly your desired condition. However, uh, and you need the oracle to be noise-free. And, and this makes sense, right? If your oracle, like if you have a predictive model for fluorescence and it has some noise, then you better never get to a point mass. You better actually be giving a distribution of sequences somehow centered around what you care about. Okay, so now I'll, this is a very new work. It's just went up on archive this week. And so I'll give you some, a, a little bit of a flavor of what the results look like here. So in this, and we started off first with a noise-free oracle. And then the, in the next uh, slide, I'll show you what happens when we add in noise. And so in this case, it's, it's noise-free. Uh, and also we've restricted the design space to be small enough that we can enumerate every possibility. So we actually know the true maximum. And what we're trying to do here is to maximize a property up to, and for, and on the, so the, let me walk you through the x-axis here. On the very right-hand side, you can see where it says 10 to the 8. If you, have if you have a sequence, a design space sequence of length 13, it corresponds to 10 to the 8 possible sequences if you wanted to enumerate every one. And of course, that's a very small design space, but it's already uh, large, <laughs> if you will. And, uh, so in, and here are various methods. So ours is the green method, which we call uh, uh, actually, this is an out of date. It's called Design by Adaptive Assembly, but we're green. And so below, uh, in, or in red, I'll, I'll walk through the legend colors. In red, there's a, an approach that actually uses activation maximization with a GAN prior on it. And you can see it's not doing very well. Below that is another method that came out this year, which is remarkably similar to the one I just told you about, only they didn't sort of derive this in, from these sort of first principles from these probabilities and sampling. So it's done in a very ad hoc way. It's not clear, uh, they don't weight the samples, it's not clear which samples to keep, but it's really, like when you read it, it's almost the same method, and you can see it performs dramatically worse. Uh, and they used a GAN in order to get an apples-apples comparison with this sort of overall procedure. We wanted to plug in exactly the same generative model, and so that's what's below it, FBVAE. And so now the only difference is sort of the scheme uh, with which we do this iteration, this in silico directed evolution. Uh, and then just as baselines, you can see random actually does pretty well because we're not in a huge design space right now. And marginal, marginal is interesting, especially for people who are interested in protein expression because it's kind of the state of the art of how people <laughs> do this right now. There's uh, commercial packages out there that you say, I want my protein to be expressed as much as possible. You tell me what nucleotides I should use, and they're basically marginal models. So, and the, wh wh what did we base the actual oracles on here? These are just randomly generated. And why did we do that? Because we just want to know, in a general sense, for very complex, nonlinear functions, how well could we solve this problem? But of course, 
Another uh, question is, are there real problems that have properties like this that we care about and for which we might be able to use this method? And so one of the problems we're very interested in is in this maximization of protein expression. So in this case, instead of sort of just randomly generating oracles, we made oracles that were grounded on real data with real patterns that we care about, and then we use those as the simulated ground truth. And here uh, you can again see the sort of how each method performs. In this case, we don't know the true maximum because the sequence, there's so many sequences here, we can't possibly enumerate them, even with a big cluster. And so that's, of course, that's, that's the real crux of this problem in the first place. If we could enumerate them, we'd be done. Um, and so on the left-hand side, you can see, uh, because the other methods here are not zero-shot methods, uh, we have to give it some training data. So we also give ourselves the same training data to seed the method. And that's what's shown uh, the black range. And again, you can see the marginal, this, this FBGAN, which is very similar to ours, and FBVAE, and then just random. And you can also look for three of these methods that do this sort of iterative, sort of in silico directed evolution. You can look at the trajectory of the distribution of samples. And um, remember I said that under certain conditions, it will collapse to a point mass. So it doesn't go exactly to a point mass, but if you look at the green one, which is our approach, I apologize, I've changed the acronyms uh, as we update archive. And, uh, and you can see it's getting very, very close to a point mass. So what the dark green line is, is the mean of the distribution. The envelope around it is one standard deviation deviation of the samples from the distribution, and the dashed line is the maximum um, achieved property from the current set of samples. Uh, and you can see that these other methods that are almost identical, uh, they're just not doing that procedure quite right. They really suffer as a result. Okay, and now something that other people haven't tackled at all is this, what I call the specification problem. So, so far I've sort of alluded to maximizing the yield or maximizing the protein, but there are many places where we actually want to specify something. And so, uh, I, 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 you can ask me offline, so there's some very interesting cases in, like called protein stoichiometry, where you want to uh, create things in particular ratios, and so it would be amazing to have this kind of control here, and also for sort of biological circuits, there's many, many places. And so this is just sort of a proof of principle that we can actually specify the range, not just maxify it, maximize it, and get a, a sequence, design a sequence which gives the desired range that we care about. And also what's kind of interesting is uh, this, and I've alluded to the fact that this would happen, you can see it happening here, is that as the noise of this sort of oracle gets bigger, so you're sort of, remember, you're replacing like a measurement in a lab with a predictive model. As the uncertainty of that predictive model gets bigger, of course you can't do as well. And so you can see the range gets worse when the noise of the stochastic oracle gets larger. And so that's exactly what we would expect to see, right? And if you had a really uncertain predictive model, then it would give you a really kind of uncertain set of examples. So, so that's where we are now. This is very new work. It's kind of proof of principle. And one thing that's interesting here is, unlike most of machine learning, it's really, really hard to test these things, right? So in standard supervised modeling, you can take a holdout set, and you can just say, what's the mean squared error? What's the classification accuracy? But think about the fact that you want to here find a sequence which maximizes, say, the fluorescence. So you, you have some training data in which that maximum doesn't exist at all. So you have no real way uh, in do computationally really validating it beyond using these sort of simulations. And so next up, we want to really convince ourselves that this is right, uh, this is going to buy us something. So we're going to try and do this probably in one of these two domains of the fluorescence or the expression. And interestingly, as I also said in the beginning, that we think this has many applications beyond here. So there's a lot of interest now in generative models for images and conditional generative models. And I think there's going to be a lot of uh, room to use this kind of approach to do that uh, really quite nicely. OK, so that was shorter than I expected, which is great, because now I can tell you a little bit more about something else that I, which I worked on for many, many years. And I'm going to first just give you a little bit of the intuition of this problem. I'm not going to go into the technical details of all those methods down there, because I'm more excited by the direction we're heading. And so I'll just give you a little bit of a teaser for that. So OK, who here already knows what a genome wide association study is? Uh, very few, very good. Okay, so it's basically, people have been chasing this for decades. You want to find the genetic underpinnings of a trait. So a trait might be like crazy weird curly hair, might be that you have cardiac disease, might be high blood pressure, and so what you're going to do is for some big group of people, such as in this room, you're going to you know, give some blood or you're going to spit in 
yeah, like kind of like 20, who's done 23 me? <laughs> wow, are you, who's scared of 23 me for privacy reasons? Who's scared of Facebook for privacy reasons? <laughs> More, okay. <laughs> Um, I don't know if they're going to broadcast this. Still. Okay, um, so, uh, so what we want to do is we want to get a group like this, and we want to say we know that you people have some, something we care about, some, dis some disease, which is horrible, but we want to understand, and the other people don't. And we want to understand the genetic underpinnings of this disease because it could help us with early diagnosis. It could also help us with doing drug development and treatment. So, the, and these markers, these markers along the genome, each individual position, like an ACTG kind of thing, we call these SNPs, because they're single nucleotide polymorphisms. There's more general things that I won't talk about. And so the desired output here is a list of genetic markers underlying that disease. And so on its face, it's actually an extremely simple uh, statistical problem. Uh, but there's this, uh, there's many, there's actually not, for, it's not for many reasons. I won't go into it any of them except for this one because it's a really big one that's dear to my heart and it's, it appears in many other application domains as well. So it's that we have hidden structure here. So if you, know, if you were to just use linear regression to do this analysis, scan along the genome, you would be making this assumption that your data are IID, right? Uh, and and this gets actually really egregiously violated, it turns out, in genetics. And in particular, it gets violated if you have these sort of pedigrees of people like grandparents, parents, uncles, these kinds of things which I mentioned before, and also if you have different ethnicities in the group, then that assumption is really, really bad, and not just as like, a, like you're a theoretical sort of person and it hurts you, like it ruins your analysis. And I'll show you that um, a little bit uh, it, just now, <laughs> actually. So but let me give you the intuition first of how that happens. So here's a particular location on the genome where you can have either an A or a T, and you have these cases, the people with the disease, and the controls, the people without the disease. And unbeknownst to you, you have these two hidden populations, this sort of hidden structure. If you didn't know they were there, uh, then you would not realize that population one tends to have more A's than T's, and that population two tends to have more T's than A's. And therefore, if you ignored those hidden populations and you did a simple statistical test, you would conclude that this particular position in the genome was associated with the case control status and therefore implicated in that disease. And so what's important to know is, is that this sort of hidden structure is pervasive in the genome. So what happens is that depending on your ethnicity background or kind of your family background, is a more refined version of that, that the probability of whether you have an A or T here is affected by that. And moreover, this happens all over the genome. And so if you don't model this or account for this, basically everything starts to look like it's implicated in a trait or a disease. Okay, so one of the beautiful things about uh, some parts of statistical genetics is that you can see things go wrong. So I actually did a master's in computer vision. You know, you do Fourier transforms, you do edge detection. You can see what's going on. When I went to biology, it was crazy. You do all this work and you have no idea. You just have some p-values or some Bayes factors. And this is one of the few places where you can kind of get a visual handle on what's going on, making some distributional assumptions. So what are those assumptions? The assumption is that um, most traits are not uh, affected by most of the genome. Only a very small part of the genome is affected by the trait. And so in particular, say we have a million markers, I, I expect only a few of those markers are going to be, say, causal for curly hair. And because of that, I can now, if, I com if I'm a frequentist and I compute p-values, one for every marker along the genome, then I know on the whole that those p-values are drawn from a null distribution, which is uniform on 0, 1, in, usually, and, and here. And so any deviation from that assumption uh, means either that I've screwed up the analysis or I have signal, but we know there should only be a little bit of signal. So if you see broad deviation from that assumption, you know you've done something terribly wrong with the analysis. This has been invaluable in helping to move statistical genetics forward. And so that's actually what's plotted right here. So it's the uh, quantiles of the expected negative log p-values. So the top right quadrant are where the very important um, points are that are implicated in the disease. Uh, and you can see basically, and right, and the y-axis are the ones I've actually observed or computed using an analysis. In this case, I, it's from a very bad analysis, and I can see that because of this massive deviation. In fact, what this is telling me is that either everything is implicated in my trait, or I've made a massive modeling error. And this data set is small enough, and, and in, you, no matter how big it is, you can never see this kind of signal. In fact, what you would like to see is a line that follows the diagonal, stays within the error bars, and just peels away a little bit at the end, and that's where the signal 
signal is, and that's what a good analysis will look like. So it's pretty remarkable that you can actually visually diagnose uh, some things even when you don't have images. So, and in contrast, here's a, a model that actually does quite well. Unfortunately, it shows that there is no signal, but you'd rather know that there's no signal than spend years chasing false leads, right? And so this is sort of, I spend many years of my life trying to move that one curve to the other curve, but also keep part of it out <laughs> where the signal is. Okay, so how can we do that? I'm going to just give you a little bit of a taste of that. So here's three, uh, this is going to be the core beast that helps us. And so what I've told you is that the problem here is effectively a heterogeneity in the similarity between people, uh, in the sense that you and I are more related because we're siblings and you're more, we're more related than you and I because you're uh, totally unrelated to me. So that's one kind or just different um, ethnicities. And so I need to somehow capture that. And the way I'm going to capture that is through this genetic similarity similarity matrix. Uh, there's sort of a whole set of theories of how to uh, compute these, but actually at the end of the day, you can just use an inner product uh, and, and have a covariance matrix, and this is actually the standard of the field right now. So on the left-hand side, you see one where there's no structure. This is a population that adheres to the IID assumption, and the off-diagonal is, is completely homogeneous, so that means everyone is equally similar or dissimilar, and uh, the diagonal is self-similarity. The second plot is this very fine-grained family structure where I have pedigrees and, and parents and this kind of stuff. And the third one, I actually have three blocks which are from different ethnic backgrounds, and within each block, I have this fine-grained family structure. So that's about as bad as it gets. I'll be honest with you, most data sets don't actually look like that, uh, but if you're interested in developing methodologies and understanding this problem, this is a very good data set to work with because it so egregiously violates uh, this assumption of IIDness. Okay, so what happens if you have data with that kind of uh, structure in it and you take different models to approach it? So this is just standard linear regression, which has this IID encoding. Uh, and if you do that, you get everything looks significant, even when nothing should be. So the next thing you can do is you can actually sort of get a summary of that genetic similarity matrix. If it happens to be low rank, you can use PCA, project everybody down into a very low dimensional space and add these as covariates. And why does that work? So I kind of alluded to this uh, in my introduction. Turns out that if you do PCA, it, it very richly recovers things that have to do with geography, and therefore uh, these things often track the ethnic background, and adding these things in as covariates uh, can do a very good job. But if, you, if you're actually truncating an important part of the Eigen spectrum, then this will not work well at all. And so these models have been brought over from animal breeding and uh, plant genetics uh, to, to human genetics over the last five to 10 years and have been extremely influential. Uh, and there, there's many ways you can explain this as a sort of hierarchical generative model, but I'm gonna focus just on the very last line because it's so intuitive. If I cross out the term with the red matrix, that's that genetic similarity matrix, then what I have left is I just have linear regression written in matrix format. And so you can see what this model is doing is it's augmenting the IID term with a rich noise structure, which is precisely the way that people are related. And so these have become extremely powerful methods. And just to give you a sense, so that's the same plot, although I've, I've truncated a bit. So if you do nothing, you get that everything looks like it's significant. If you correct for the low rank structure, which are those three blocks, basically, you bring it back almost within the error bars. And if you do the mixed model, then you actually get something that brings it all the way in and reveals that there is no signal. So these, I spend a lot of time working on these. They're very expensive, just like Gaussian process regression and kernel methods, and so we can use some sort of domain-specific tricks to make these faster. Um, and just, but very quickly before I run out of time, I want to say that that's mostly old work. And what gets really interesting uh, for me right now is all this time I've mentioned scalar traits, right? Like curly hair, cardiac disease. It's like each person has one number. But what if we have richer traits? So what if we have, for example, volumes of imaging of brain scans or hearts? And maybe we even have them over time. So now I have spatial structure. I have time structure. And moreover, I might not even know what the important trait is to look at. So I want to correlate the genetics with the imaging, and, I'm, and it's got this very complex structure, and I may not even know where in the image the trait of interest is. And so you can start to ask, uh, like, can we use sort of semi-supervised uh, methods to understand, to pick out the traits and things like this. And so this actually, at the big annual genetics meeting in San Diego next week, uh, Paolo, who's driven this, is going to show some results on how we have kind of pulled out some interesting part of the images and found some genetic signal.
Okay, so I think I need to leave three minutes for questions. So I'm just going to, as I said, David drove the protein design problem, and Paolo, who's still a postdoc at Microsoft, has been driving this uh, imaging GWAS. So thank you. Thank you very much. This is a very fascinating work. We have time for a few questions. Please come to the microphones. So while you're coming to the microphones, um, I'd like to ask a, a question about you know, the, your algorithm, uh, your, your novel algorithm. You didn't say anything about you know, how fast it converges. Where yeah. you know, it's so, I mean, so it's interesting, because it actually has the property, because it's stochastic, that as long as the generative model uh, can, in principle, generate any possible sequence, it means that if we run it to infinity, it will always get to where we want. So it has this property, the longer we run it, the more likely we are to get somewhere. And so you have to declare a particular convergence. And you can there's different ways you could impose a convergence. We didn't do convergence for those plots because we wanted an apples to apples comparison. And this is like a little bit in the eye of the beholder. So instead, we developed what we call a sequence budget, where basically each method is in some sense allowed to touch like a, a budget of things in the design space so many times. And then, I mean, you can just see, though, that ours, ours look like it converged. And the other ones, even if you run them longer, they actually mostly just plateau. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, for the protein design uh, work, uh, I understand that you want to uh, maximize the desired action. What if you accidentally max maximize some undesired action, which may or may not even be in your training data, which yeah. translates into... Are you talking uh, about fairness in protein design? <laughs> No, I'm talking about the uh, side yeah. effect of the drug. Right, yeah, yeah, I, I, okay. I was making an analogy that, you know, in, in other places in machine learning, we're accidentally doing bad things, and so people are now trying to bring these to light. So I think there is an analog here. And just as in fairness in AI, you need to know what you care about in order to avoid getting there, right? So it's the same thing here. Like, if you don't know what you need to avoid, you can't avoid it. So as long as you know, we can actually uh, accommodate any number of properties and in any number of ways. So one problem, like, for example, you wipe, a good example of what you just said is maybe that as I maximize the protein, the fitness of the cell gets worse and then the cell dies, right? So this is, I think, what you're talking about. So if we have some way to predict both of those, then we can incorporate, we can say, make sure you're alive enough and subject to that, maximize the expression. So as long as we know what we want and we have some predictive model for it, we can bake it all in simultaneously. Thank you. Hi, uh, very nice talk. Um, the assumption of the oracle seems pretty strong <laughs> because you're going to be visiting parts of design space that you haven't seen before. Yes, And yes. the errors in your oracle are presumably correlated with the parts of space you're exploring. So, right, so I didn't harp on this, but I, just, right, the big, the big linchpin here is how good is that oracle? And so, well, I mean, one thing is just like how good is it subject to increasing noise, but another was if you want to extrapolate, uh, first of all, you need to understand where you're extrapolating. So you want something like that gives you rich error, like a Gaussian process regression, or as people are pushing the forefront with neural networks, we might also get this. And so the question is, you know, and is, but you know, ask who believes in extrapolation. Uh, I don't. I, I, who believes in extrapolation? I don't know, I'm curious to hear. A lot of people don't. I think that extrapolation is very hard. I think it's possible. I mean, we know, for example, linear regression, like you have a linear trend that does extrapolate really well. As the model gets more complex, obviously, it's more tricky. And the, the real question here is, like, can we extrapolate enough that this buys us something, right? Like, of course, we can't extrapolate perfectly out to infinity. And so this is, right, we need, to, um, we need to check these things. We need to do more power simulations in silico, and then we need to actually do lab experiments and see where we get. And also, can you talk about the connection with CMAES and things like that? It seems extremely similar. See, actually, I thought you were going to say CM because that, there's something... Oh, cross-entropy method. Yeah, yeah. so I, yeah. that's interesting. No one I've ever asked, like, no, has heard of this. So there's a very strong connection between this and something called the cross-entropy method, mm -hmm. which, and so interestingly, the cross-entropy method was first developed as a way to estimate rare events. And that, as you may recall, I said I have this objective function, and the problem is that this thing is rare, and so it makes the Monte Carlo estimate be very high variance. And so we have a very direct analog to how cross-entropy method uh, tackles that. We tackle it in, in a very analogous way. I'm not sure what the other acronym you used was, though. Uh, oh, covariance matrix estimation evolutionary strategies. Uh, it's a Peter Beal, one of your colleagues uses it a lot ah. for 
optimizing okay. controllers of robots. Oh, so there's also, like interestingly... Uh, right, you have a Gaussian, and it, it's basically the same way your generative model is a Gaussian, as far as I understand. I think maybe... So I know something called, from reinforcement learning, called re-weighted... Uh, re-weighted... Uh, R... Am I going to... There's, I, can't, I can't remember the acronyms, it's not my area, but there's also a very tight connection between the cross-entropy method and methods used in reinforcement learning. So mm. yeah, these things are all actually quite intimately connected. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, one, one last question. Uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. I wanted to find out, instead of searching for reinforcement learning or one model or the other, is it possible for us to layer many models over each other? Um, similar to like what AutoML is doing or what H2OAI is doing, where we can apply uh, several models and see what is the model that gives us the best results. So for which problem are you referring? The same problem that you are talking about. So Instead of trying to search one method, one model, and see what we get, or next model and see what we get. So I think, I think let me rephrase the question to what... Uh, how I understand it, I think what you're saying is like, what's the, you can use AutoML to find the best Oracle if you have data on which to train an Oracle. In some cases, we want to absorb domain expert models and we don't have access to data, which is why we have the black box criterion. If we have access to the data, we can use any AutoML pipeline to find the best Oracle possible. Uh, and then our, that's just plugs and plays with our method. So I don't think there's any reason to do AutoML in our method. You do AutoML to components in our method, uh, which plug and play. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Let's uh, thank again our speaker. <laughs>